Welcome to the Derek Loudermilk Show. This is episode 382 with Tom Palladino. Tom Palladino is a scalar physics researcher, inventor, and healer. Tom has spent decades researching scalar energy, and he has perfected a device that allows him to use scalar energy to dematerialize pathogens such as HIV, and we'll talk about a clinical study uh, where he's basically eliminated HIV from thousands of patients. Uh, He's also able to do this with other viruses and bacteria pathogens, Um, but he's also able to assemble nutrients and hormones from their raw atomic components. And Tom is what I might term the scientific or intellectual grandson of Nikola Tesla, meaning he studied under Galen Hieronymus, who was mentored by Tesla. So he's like the mentee of the mentee of Tesla. So in this episode, you're going to learn what is scalar energy, because that's not what we generally learn about in our scientific textbooks. Well, it's a separate form of energy, separate from the electromagnetic spectrum, but it interacts with the electromagnetic forces. So you're going to learn about how scalar energy affects and interacts with light, gravity, consciousness, electromagnetism, and all the other forces in in physics. Another fascinating part of this conversation is how scalar energy and understanding of scalar energy could be used to create a free energy device or an anti-gravity device, both of which Tom is currently working on. And as an inventor, as an experimentalist, how he is approaching creating these devices, which is just mind-blowing and so exciting that it feels so tangible. They're almost here. And Tom may be just the person to bring this to the wider world. So without further ado, here is Tom Palladino. Tom Palladino, welcome to the show. Derek, it is a pleasure. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, it's great. Great to meet you. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if we could just sort of jump right out of the gate with like a like a pow amazing story from your your work. I know you've had some pretty remarkable results with the device you've created, and we'll get into some of the science. But I don't know if there's a if a story that you really love to share, um, just about something that even surprised you with how, how well it's worked. Well, it's topical to that matter. Um, I'm working with an HIV AIDS clinic in Delhi, India. And we've already worked with 4,000 people who were were HIV positive. Now, um, these people are providing testimonies. After we work with them, with this scalar energy instrument, these people in Delhi, India, say that they feel better. They say that they, their appetite has returned and that they're no longer HIV positive. And I think that's very important because we've worked with 4,000 people. It's a clinical study in Delhi, India. And how could 4,000 people be wrong? They're not. They're not. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, What a hopeful um, result. And so so you said this is part of a clinical study that you're doing. How's, How's that set up? Um, we're working through, through an NGO, it's called Om Prakash, and they allow us access to people who are HIV positive. And to uh, clue the audience in, every time we work with people, we work with their photograph. There's no in-person session. So we're working in the quantum field or the information field. So people from Delhi, India, send us photographs. And we're able to detect, if you will, through their photograph, the presence of HIV, the virus, and destroy it. So this is the new science of scalar energy. It's not a biological process. It's an informational process. We work through a person's photograph. Yeah, so there's there's so many things. Uh, the follow-up question, um, 
I, I guess I'm also, so I come from a scientific background. I happen to be a virologist by training. So I have a bit of an understanding of just like how to set up experiments and studies. Okay. Um, so what, what are you, what are you measuring here? Um, yeah. Other than That's they're feeling, good. feeling better. Yeah, and that's a good point. So um, many of these people have had a follow-up PCR test, and that's the best I can do. A PCR test that will, you know, according to the standards that they have available to them in Delhi, India, is either the presence or absence and uh, of the HIV virus. And what we see is after the scalar energy sessions, there is no viral load as per the PCR test and the criteria that is followed in Delhi, India. So this now, it becomes a nebulous topic, and I realize as a virologist, you, you get what I'm getting at. Uh, a PCR test is, is highly vaunted, but it's still subject to interpretation. And according to the, the, the criteria that's been established in India, at least from this clinic that, that we're receiving a PCR test, the people say that they no longer have a detectable viral load. That is, we, we cannot measure any copies per milliliter of blood of any artifact of any sample of the HIV virus. So that's, it's undetected according to their, according to their um, consideration. And that's a good indication that something favorable is happening. Obviously, PCR testing is not fail safe, but it's the best type of testing I think we have to ascertain especially the presence of a virus such as um, HIV virus. Perhaps what is even more promising is everybody that I've worked with, their CD4 count has uh, increased significantly. Some people had a 350, 400 CD4 count. Now their CD4 count is 800 or 900. And that is quite significant. As we realize the the HIV virus will target those lymphocytes and, and will impair their function. So those two markers are very telling and they're very important to this clinical study that we're conducting in, in Delhi, India. No viral load after we work with people with a scalar energy instrument and their CD4 count is significantly higher after the scalar energy sessions. Um, all of that is nonetheless subject to interpretation. Uh, and 900 is a normal range for CD4? I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, I, I, I would say most people, if they have an 800 or 900 range, that's excellent. That's excellent, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, and so my understanding from what I've, I've looked into your work so far is that your, your theory or what you've observed is that uh, the virus load goes away because you're deconstructing the virus into yes. its elemental particles like carbon or oxygen. Yes, exactly. It's that simple. Thank you, Derek. It's that simple. I, if, if my fist represents the HIV virus, I can break it down. I can negate the molecular bonds and it shatters into proteins and elements. So we take an infectious agent and we reduce it to its components, its building blocks, carbon, oxygen, proteins, various, various lipids, or, or uh, a, a, again, it's, it's a deconstruction of a virus. We do this by negating the molecular bonds. It's a simple, straightforward process. It always works because it's a fundamental, it's a primal force in nature. Scan energy is a primal force. And we ask that primal force to act upon the HIV virus, it does so. And it will deconstruct, it will disassemble that virus on the spot. This, this takes place instantaneously. So it's the easy way to break down a microbe. Cool. And, and um, this is reminding me of, I, I toured the uh, toxic waste incinerator operated by the 3M company. Uh, it's how they get rid of a lot of their industrial waste to break it down. It's super high temperature incinerator. Um, so they, they have to run it. It's like 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. And, you know, something instead of poisoning groundwater it would just be converted to basic carbon. Um, but obviously you're not incinerating in, remotely inside right. of people's bodies. So, um, well, have you, have you observed this or how do you know it's, it's like 
dematerializing or, or disintegrating. Now, I, I had the good fortune. I worked with a third party once and we were able to deconstruct um, pond scum, protozoan, under observation. And this is frankly done out of state. So I, I was able to work at a distance with pond scum. Uh, we were able to view that pond scum under a, um, uh, uh, if you will, an electron microscope and see that pond scum deconstruct, disassemble. So that experiment proved that scalar energy could work at a distance, influence pond scum, and then cause it to deconstruct under the influence of my instrument. Now, obviously, I cannot see the negation of a molecular bond, so I have to rely upon people and what they tell me by their experience. So uh, as, a, as another matter, people will tell me that um, uh, after one session, one session that they feel an, an alleviation of suffering, whether it's from, from a fungal infection or a bacterial infection, so I, I'm going to say that this energy is fundamental. Once again, it controls the molecular structure of bacteria, fungi, et cetera, and that it only takes one session to negate those molecular bonds, whether they're hydrogen bonds or covalent bonds. And in so doing, the microbe, the microorganism falls apart. And uh, so it sounds like a specific targeting action. It's not destroying the normal cells of the body, um, how do you ensure the specificity? Yeah, very good. Everything I do is by way of a photograph. So I'm going to hold up a photograph of the herpes virus. I can actually place a photograph of a microbe inside my instrument. And then my instrument would target this virus. So I program the instrument. I program the instrument by photographs. I have thousands of photographs of different types of microbes. And I simply place the photograph of the microbe in the instrument, and then the instrument will seek out and destroy the herpes virus. Okay, interesting. And and is that based on intention? Is that based on like settings? You're turning knobs. Like how does it? How do you program it? This is the way the instrument is calibrated. It's calibrated to to decipher any photograph that I place inside the instrument. And then working in a reverse phase fashion of reversing the, if you will, molecular bonds of the herpes virus, the instrument will automatically negate the herpes virus, those molecular bonds anywhere, whether it's in a person or in an animal. So the instruments have been calibrated to, as a reverse phase to break down the molecular bonds. Hence, all I need to do is instruct the instrument what to break down, in this case, a photograph of the herpes virus instructs the instrument to negate those molecular bonds. So in it a nutshell- Sounds like you could also do the opposite. You could like build build it yes. if you if you switch the, yes. I don't know, reverse so it. So one instrument is a reverse phase instrument that I break down microbes and toxins. I have another instrument that's in phase. I can take a photograph of vitamin E place it in the instrument, and in phase, the instrument will start to assemble the molecular bonds of vitamin E. So mm. we can break down what's harmful or create what is beneficial. Amazing. Um, okay, so, so the device itself, um, how long did it take you to make it? What is it like? It, these these are very good. These are instruments calibrated um, uh, after years of, of study um, from the inventor Galen Hieronymus. Galen Hieronymus was perhaps one of the first uh, scalar energy uh, researchers. I studied under his wife, Galen Hieronymus. And many of my principles um, derive from the work of Galen Hieronymus. Um, I met the Hieronymus family back in 1993, and I've perfected their instruments over the years. I work with an engineering staff, and today, 30 years from that time, we have perfected these instruments to the point where they're, they're dependable. These instruments can perform a repeatable function whereby we can easily instruct this instrument to destroy any type of microbe 
or to create any type of nutrient and will do so. Wow. Okay. And then, so the, the Hieronymus family, when did, I'm, I'm curious, like how, how long this project has been just kind of like the history of the whole project. Yeah. Galen Hieronymus was born in 1895. He was one of the um, country's premier electrical engineers, but during his career in the thirties and forties, he discovered the other energy, scalar energy. And he was actually awarded a patent in 1949 or a scalar energy instrument, a U.S. patent. And he worked his entire life trying to promulgate this, this new science, this new branch of physics, but it really never caught on in his lifetime. Well, I met up with the family in 1993, and <clears throat> the inventor had died, but um, his wife, Sarah, continued on with the research, and she more or less passed on instruments to me. I could actually buy scalar energy instruments from her. And I took up... Uh, um, this science after the Hieronymus family had, had passed on. Um, more or less, they passed the baton to me, if you will. So it's it's we're going on now probably close to a century of engineering and a century of discovery from the 30s and until the present day, uh, 2022. And it, I, I just want to make this very clear that there's very few scientists, bona fide scalar energy scientists. Nikola Tesla, in my estimation, was the first man to control and harness this energy. Hieronymus was another. But very few people realize that there's two distinct energies and they have to be approached from a, a different standpoint. Yeah, I want to I want to get into that at some point, but I'm I'm curious how you got into this work. Uh, it was God's call. God wanted me to get involved in this. I I felt called. I felt the Holy Spirit inspired me to get involved in this. It's um it's a lifetime of work, and when I was called by God to to get into this type of research, I knew that this was an immense undertaking, absolutely immense. And how did that calling come to you? I have, um, well, let's call them mystical impulses. When when I started to read about the Hieronymus work and, and the inventions, I knew instinctively how these instruments worked. I, I understood that these instruments were informational in character, that these instruments would capture the, the energy of the cosmos, the energy of the stars. So God has given me that that inbuilt mysticism, if you will, that ability to understand a rather arcane science and to understand it to the point that I could develop at, le at least some type of working theory around this. You know, keep in mind, everything that I've done and Hieronymus has done, it's, it's all groundbreaking. There is no college textbook. You will not find a college textbook here. You were interested in this, or you were getting these uh, divine uh, inspiration before you met the Hieronymus family? Yes, yeah, before, before. God was preparing me. And once I met the family, I, I put it all together, and I said, this is it. This is what God wants me to, to spend my time and my energy on. You know, to put this in a nutshell, this energy is from God. It's a divine light. Why do I say that? For various reasons. Scalar energy never degrades. There is no entropy. So what type of energy form never experiences any type of entropy? It has to be some type of divine character. And that's what I've stepped into. Undercoming, if you will, this, this divine energy that never experiences entropy. An energy that is so vast, you cannot measure it because it's essentially everywhere. It's it's an omnipresence of God. We'll get into that later, but um, these are some of the characteristics that I've uh, described through my journey learning about scalar energy. And did you, um, during this, this whole time, did you ever, um, I don't know, second guess that this was the right path uh, because it sounds like it's a little bit lonely uh, if no one else is doing it. <laughs> it's a very lonely path. It is a singular path. You're absolutely right. I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. I see the great prospect. I see the potential here. And to this day, I remain one of the few scalar energy researchers with a bona fide 
model, the working model, and the ability to perf- not only perfect that model, but but to show um, meaningful results. I'm all about results. So these instruments have to produce some type of result. Otherwise, it's still theory. Well, it's more than that. I can prove myself time and time again. So the instruments work. It's a repeatable process. The upshot, the results are favorable. I'm ready now to take on the world. What does that mean, take on the world? I want to heal the world. A scalar energy instrument can easily work with a million, two million people a day. I want to, I want to heal the world through through this divine energy. I mean, heard of that. You know, why should I wait? And why should I not promulgate something that that is of such benefit, of such merit? I realize I'm stepping on some toes here, but that's that's too bad. This is a new paradigm. It offers a new medical model, if you will. And I am going to move forward with this. It's going to change the medical landscape, mark my word. What would it take to heal 2 million people a day? Grassroots effort. That's all. We could scale this quickly if people participate. And if people would send in their, their photograph and at least experience these sessions. So how do I scale this with people, all grassroots? One of the reasons I want to keep it grassroots, Derek, is I don't want to um, have to answer to a board of directors. I I don't want anybody um, getting in the middle of this with with a financial concern. So if I keep it pure, I keep it clean, um, I only answer to God and the people. I don't have to uh, worry about investors. I don't have to worry about share price. I don't have to worry about reputation. And we just move forward. It's a healing ministry. That's it. There's no politics attached. Uh, have you considered just building a lot of these devices and selling them to individuals that want to operate them? I'm not in the position to, to manufacture. And if I was, I would not manufacture this instrument. They're very powerful, and they could be used to harm. Because you can create anything or destroy yes, anything. Exactly. Is there so? Okay, this, say somebody wanted to use it for harm. Is there any way to protect against it? No. 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 You see okay. why I won't manufacture this, Derek? I will <laughs> not let. There's some things I know about scalar energy. I won't release to the general public. These are powerful tools. I would not want this tool in the hands. A, a malevolent party. Okay, then, then how do you uh, how do you ensure that currently? It's under lock and key. It's under my observation, twenty four hours, and that's the best way. And and God and His angels protect me. Uh, it, this is a very powerful energy. Now, I'll I'll titillate the audience. I believe that the Ark of the Covenant mentioned in the in the Old Testament, I believe the Ark of the Covenant was a scalar energy device. So what has God given me? He's given me the modern day equivalent, the modern day equivalent of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, if you if you remember from biblical study that the Ark of the Covenant was very powerful. Well, that's what I have, a very powerful instrument. This is not to be toyed with. Uh, dissolve the walls of Jericho or something like that. Is that right? You, you're very right. You're you're right. Um, um, in procession uh, around the walls of Jericho and eventually accompanied by the Ark of the Covenant, something happened. Either the, either the ground gave way or the walls crumbled. But yes, um, it brought the Israelites uh, an advantage. And that's the effect you would expect scalar energy device to, to yeah. be able to do. A very, very strong scalar energy device could could easily change the, the physical nature of anything. So let's, um, I was just having a discussion um, last week about, um, so, I, so I have had a telepathy researcher, a remote viewing researcher, Stefan Schwartz, on the show and he basically said you know we eliminated every possible uh electromagnetic um 
possibility. So telepathy is not electromagnetic. And, and so he's like, it's, it's a, it's a consciousness based um, <clears throat> mode of communication. And, and then, so, so my question was like, well, is there, is it energy or is it more fundamental than energy? But it sounds like potentially what you're saying is that, um, so scalar energy is a type of energy and electromagnetism is a type of energy. Um, could you just talk a little bit more about like what scalar energy mm -hmm. is? Scalar energy is massless. It's non-physical and it's the, it is the animating force behind telepathy. Telepathy is a gift. People can interpret dreams. People can communicate at a distance. Um, some people call those locutions. Um, others call that the inner voice or the ability to remote view, which really is the gift of prophecy. All of that is under the banner of scalar energy, which is another dimension of energy. It's not electromagnetic. And science must come to this realization that scalar energy has different properties than that of electricity and magnetism. Scalar energy, hence, has a different outcome. There are principles that scalar energy follows that are not electrical principles. So many times when we look at nature, we cannot readily understand and, and fathom what nature has to offer us. Okay, so be it. That's most likely a scalar energy paradigm. I'll give you a for instance. If you look at the plasma state, many times we see stars in a plasma state. And many astrophysicists say, well, this is outside of our realm. We don't quite understand the principles. We don't understand the laws that are being obeyed. Well, they would if they would consider that those laws are scalar energy laws. When you look at a quasar or a plasma ball out, in outer space, that's a scalar energy environment. It's not electricity. And once the world realizes that there's two energies and hence there's two possibilities, everything can be explained. Finally, we have an answer to what's a qu quasar. It's a scalar energy radiating star. What's a pulsar? What's a plasma field? It's scalar. It's a local scalar energy environment. It's not an electromagnetic environment. So I'm trying to make this very clear. It's so cut and dry. It's so simple. There's two choices. There's two, you know, just stop trying to put, put everything in the box, the electromagnetic box. There's two boxes. It's that simple. Do the two interact? They do. <clears throat> it's my contention that scalar energy is the initial energy of the universe. It's a double helix. And that double helix will degrade, break down into electricity and magnetism. So the actual, the actual double helix unbinds and one strand becomes electricity, the other becomes elect magnetism. Why do I say that? Well, my predecessor was able to take a scalar wave and degrade it into electricity and magnetism, as I am able to do. So you see this conversion from scalar into electromagnetic energy. And that happens rather um, easily. It's, there, there's no abrupt discharge or violent shock. So we see it really is a, a, a bi-directional uh, phenomenon. Scalar will degrade into electromagnetic energy, and then you can eventually regroup electromagnetic energy into a double helix, into scalar energy. But the primary, the, the driver of the universe is always scale of energy. The secondary energy is electricity and magnetism. Okay, so you said scalar degrades into electromagnetism. Yes, correct. Okay, um, what's, the, what's the interaction between thought or consciousness and scalar energy? Scalar energy is a waveform. It is a brain form. It is a thought form. So any type of creativity, thought form, any type of, um, um, if you will, cognitive effort, it, it is always a scalar wave. Scalar energy is a driver behind cognitive thought. Now, you can measure its derivative, electromagnetic energy, by a, an EKG. Yes, you can. Um, by brain waves, yes, because scalar will degrade into electromagnetic energy, but it's and it's very fundament. All brain waves are are scalar energy in origin. 
Scalar energy is the fundamental the driver of all brain waves. Uh, I had Eben Alexander, the neuroscientist, on the show, and he said, you know, the brain is is like a receiving device for consciousness or, or a filter in a way. Uh, what's your understanding of, of the function of the brain? I agree with him. I agree with him. The, the brain, even though it's a physical organ, it's much more than that. The brain is is it is a, allows itself to think outside of that confine the the brain the mind really is a filter or an antenna if you will for thought patterns for for notions for creativity never think about creativity how is it that some people are so creative where does that come from well it it has to come from this consciousness it has to come from this this universe of possibility. So once we start delving into this, we realize that the physical brain is a limitation. It's what what's outside of that. It's the what some call the all-seeing eye, the, the Akashic record, call it what you will. That's the infinite source of intelligence of the universe. So we, we limit ourselves. The universe has an infinite source of intelligence, of instructions. And once we can tap into that, my goodness, we've tapped into the, if you will, the mother load of intelligence. Do you have a personal practice for tapping into creativity or, or this intelligence? <clears throat> Prayer, meditation. I always like to spur myself on when I'm researching every day. I like to think of one or two notions um, that would be outside of the box. And, and try to expand on that, use my creativity to expand upon that. I just don't want to do the same thing every day. So I challenge myself. I, I believe in being creative. I believe in trying always a new approach, or at least uh, thinking about a new approach. Yeah, wonderful. Um, what's, what's the interaction with gravity? Is there something, connection with yeah. gravity? <laughs> Scalar energy is the cause of gravity. Now you've, you've seen this rather eloquent Newtonian concept that gravity equals a gravitational con constant multiplied by two, the mass of two objects divided by its distance squared. Well, that's, that's a relationship. It, it describes gr gravity here on the surface of the Earth. It, but that's, that's not the definition of gravity. Gravity is caused by scalar energy. Scalar energy is the cause of gravity. I can prove that because there have been scalar energy researchers who have negated gravity and who've levitated. So obviously their mass or the mass that levitated did that mass did not change. Why, why did the mass now levitate? Because it's no longer under the influence of scalar energy. We see examples of, of anti-gravity, uh, the bumblebee, produces an anti-gravity force field, a scalar energy force field. Bumblebees are not aerodynamically sound. They're, they're, uh, they're compromised. <laughs> they're compromised. Why does a bumblebee fly? It doesn't. It levitates. It levitates. There are vortices or vortical action, call it what you will. And bumblebees levitate. Do you, do you know the mechanism? How do they do that? You know, I, I believe when they start beating their wings, they set up, if you will, this double helix, this vortex. And it doesn't take much for a bumblebee to experience that anti-gravity force field. Um, we, there was a man by the name of Viktor Grebenikov who developed a scalar energy flying platform. And it, it doesn't take much. It just takes the right energy, the right scalar energy. And Grebenikov was able to fly around on this anti-gravity platform at high speeds, and in so doing, he never experienced G-forces because he was outside of the electromagnetic dimension. He was inside the scalar energy dimension, in which he was not assaulted by G-forces. So whether it's a bumblebee or a Benikov on his flying platform, this is tenable. This has been done before. I seem to remember that he was observing insect bodies or insect wings yes. and and like made an array of insect wings and yes there's these like little pock marks in the wings or something that yes assist with yeah. that 
Um, what what yeah, Gorbenikov described was some type of a pyramidal shape. It was a hexagon, but nonetheless, it was stellated in, uh, into a pyramid. And he felt that that shape, that that hexagonal pyramid, allowed him to experience some type of negation of gravity. And you're right, he was working with beetle wings. Apparently, he placed a number of beetle wings on the underside of this flying platform, and he could fly. He could create an anti-gravity uh, platform. And uh, according to his merit, he flew at hundreds of miles an hour, and he never experienced any G-forces because he was in that scalar energy force field. It was no longer an electromagnetic force field. He was outside of time and space, and he had no influence. He was he was unencumbered by G forces. Uh, have you have you tried this? I'm trying it right now. I you are. Yeah, it's not working. I tried it. It's not working. I have to. In order to negate gravity, you, you have to understand gravity, what causes it, and then just flip it or create the polarity to that. Do I think I, I can create the polarity to gravity? Yes. And in so doing, I should be able to create an anti-gravity instrument. That's that's really exciting. Um, what's So where are you in the process? Like, how, how, how do you approach that? You know, it all depends upon God. God. God actually gave me a promise years ago that he would allow me to create anti-gravity, but it's not the time. It's not the time yet. The world, we have to, to, to be quite candid, we have to take all of these um, advances uh, step by step, almost baby steps with mankind. You know, what I announced at the beginning of our interview that I had discovered the technique to destroy, to eradicate the HIV virus. And I have 4,000 people in Delhi, India, who can testify to that veracity, that statement. Well, should that be head nine? News? Yes. Why isn't that headline news? The world's not ready for it. The world's not ready for anti-gravity either. Sure. This this is a process. But I'm ready. Uh, you're ready because you're open to this and you've done your <laughs> homework. You've done your homework. You know, I asked the audience, those who are going to watch this video, do your homework. Visit my website. Look at the hundreds of test results of people say they no longer have herpes. Is, is that valid? Of course it's valid. You know, the world asks for scientific evidence. Okay, visit my website. I have many scientific tests. Why isn't this taking off? It takes time. Hmm. It takes people have to digest this. All right. That's fair. Um, but I'm still curious, like, uh, approaching it like a problem-solving challenge or an engineering challenge. Like, how do you, how do you go about engineering uh, anti-gravity? device imitate what Grubenikov did he, he there's ample uh, evidence of what he's accomplished there's even photographs of him levitating um, what do I propose uh, visiting Grubenikov understanding how he achieved what what he called this flying platform and then just duplicate his results you no know, is, is he alive no he passed on, I think, in 2000. Okay, yeah. but so did he publish this, or is it... He, he published did... it, but the Russian government um, did not want the dissemination of this information. So the communists in Russia blocked that. So what is my point? The point is that this information can be readily, readily, if you will, uh, duplicated. We, Grabenikov has done it. Take a look at his flying platform and just recreate it. And somebody out there has to have that wherewithal or that drive to do so. I'm trying to do that, but I'm I'm blocked right now. I, I'm a, I'm at a standstill. Creative, creatively, or creatively, yeah, <clears throat> creatively. In theory, I know what he's doing. <laughs> it's very simple. It's very straightforward. If you look at Rubenikov's flying platform, there are no moving parts. Mm -hmm. And he simply had a hand lever which he would control with more or less like flaps or some, some type of control 
the the angle of incidence, if you will, of these beetle wings and, and how he would manipulate these beetle wings. L long and short of it is that's the propulsion. You just have to manipulate the, the angle of these beetle wings. I know that the... Um like the salmon when they go up the really tall waterfalls, like the hundred foot waterfalls past what they're able to jump. They yeah. there's like some sort of vortex created in the water as it lands. And then the fish spend some time in the vortex. And then, yeah. then they kind of like shoot up a hundred feet yes. through the water. So it's like, they like charge up maybe with scalar energy. Yes. Um, You're right. Is, you've, done, you've done your homework. Um, Many fish, when they're when they're spawning, you know, and you've seen that with salmon, are able to, if you will, propel themselves out of the water, and almost by way of anti gravity, able to force their way up a stream. Now that that is outside the the laws of electromagnetic energy. They're working in a scalar energy paradigm. A vortex, indeed, has been created. And those fish experience some type of scalar energy presence. It's, it's, if you really look at these fish in, in motion, it's almost as if you can see them almost in slow motion, how this is a scalar energy anti-gravity event. It, it's outside of, of what I would call Newtonian physics. So yes, there are two physics and those fish, when, when they're trying to swim upstream, they are experiencing some type of anti-gravity atmosphere. You're right. Gosh, yeah. uh, now it's making me think of the, um, the megalithic structures, like the stones that, yeah. um, yes. that are sort of appear as if they've been, they were a, a stone but then they turned into some sort of malleable form because the stones are like bent and this you know the seal between the cracks is you know perfectly matched yes. especially in peru i'm thinking of um would this be yes. a scalar application as well it has to be some of these uh, uh these building projects call them building projects monuments to this day there is not a crane in operation that can maneuver some of these stones. And one stone is placed on top of the other, you know, a hundred tons, 200 tons. There is no crane in operation. There is no tensile strength wire that could lift a hundred tons and set it upon another stone. It, it had to be some type of anti-gravity mechanism that built these, many of these, these cities or, or pyramids or, or obelisks, um, you know, it's 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 implausible. So, how do we get around that? We have to admit to the fact that ancient societies had some access to scalar energy, anti gravity, or it could have been the demon world that had access to anti gravity, and in so doing, we see that these great monuments that today defy logic. It, you had to be working with a different physics. I, I believe, frankly, I believe many of the pyramids were built in such a fashion. If you look at the hundreds of thousands of pyramids around the world, then you have to start asking yourself, well, that's rather laborious. I would never want to build a pyramid. By the way. <laughs> I, I, it's just it's way behind me. That's a lot of work. And you, you would need a superior tool to build a pyramid. You can't do that with manual labor. Yeah, that would that just seems such a huge undertaking. I would never want to build the pyramid. <laughs> um, have you uh, have you been to the pyramids? I've seen the pyramids in Mexico. Yeah, mm. and I and I look at the they're gigantic, and you know you really have to start saying to yourself, what what would the wherewithal bill be? What would the uh, building materials and the labor entail? to build those pyramids. And, and I'm saying to myself, this, this has to be some type of a supernatural force. You, you, all of Mexico could not build those pyramids. Why build a pyramid? What would you derive from? It? What's the point? You know, you, you can't feed yourself. 
Anyway, long story short, there's a supernatural character to many of these pyramids. And I would contend that, that some of these pyramids have, have an evil character to them. You know, I'd have to be specific to each pyramid here and there. But What makes that, you say that? Uh, many of those pyramids um, uh, give credence to evil or to the devil. They don't give credence to God, to Jesus. So what many is, of those pyramids... Mean? Credence, or, or, or they acknowledge evil. They acknowledge evil. Many of those pyramids, in my estimation, are are temples of evil. I don't I don't believe they're temples of enlightenment. You know, it's it's been said that many of these pyramids were places of human sacrifice. Well, that's not advanced. That's rather evil. That's rather barbaric. So I would just caution the audience. You know, there. There are some things that we don't quite understand, and this gets into the realm of the supernatural. I believe many of the pyramids had a supernatural origin. Um, okay, a couple of questions. Uh, my my presumption would be that any sacrifice associated with the pyramids would be someone who just came across the pyramids, and they're like, oh, sweet, a thing that we can use, that it was already there when those sacrificial cultures came and they're they're like for some reason had sacrificial culture and they just use what was there that would be my uh most plausible assumption okay um but then so when you say supernatural uh how is that different than scalar well, I'm speaking now of the construction of pyramids. Many of the pyramids, if you look just how ornate they are and how sophisticated they are, that some pyramids actually capture scalar energy, or scalar energy batteries or capacitors. To this day, I don't think we have the, the uh, knowledge to create a stone spear, uh, pyramid that would serve as a capacitor, would create or at least harness scalar energy. So that's the supernatural character. In other words, I don't believe man had that intellect three, 4,000 years ago to create hundreds of pyramids that would all capture scalar energy and that their design was essentially flawless design. I don't think we had that capability three or 4,000 years ago. So I attribute some pyramids to a supernatural building, supernatural design. I find the most plausible explanation to be just uh, a well-practiced uh, engineering species, like the ancient aliens hypothesis, like people that are really good at building pyramids and harnessing scalar energy, and they had like a very specific use to build those pyramids. You said, "Why build a pyramid?" So it seemed like if you're gonna if you're gonna be able to build lots and lots of huge pyramids, you you would have the scientific and engineering knowledge to, to be able to do that. You're right. Somebody had the scientific and engineering knowledge to do that. Again, it's my contention three or 4,000 years ago, it wasn't, it wasn't man. We, we did not have, we were not that advanced three or 4,000 years ago. So I, I firmly believe that the fallen angels, the demons have made, created many of the pyramids. I'll go on record by saying that. And uh, my my understanding would be that fallen angels, as they're sort of written about in the Bible, are simply like a different race that operates from sort of a higher perspective of consciousness. Yeah, they um, any whether it's a, an angel of light or an angel of darkness, these these angels still have supernatural ability. They're angels. They, they far exceed human ability far exceed um, the ability of man. Right, but I think you're, you're calling it supernatural when when really like whatever they're able to do should be explainable by physics on some dimension, right? At, at, yes, can be explained by physics, scalar physics. What am I getting at? I believe there are angels and I believe they are scalar energy beings. And this is why it's, uh, a, an angel has such incredible ability, because they can control nature through scalar energy. So yes, 
you know, if we look at it just as a mere human, so to speak, it's supernatural because an angel can control nature, can control this, has dominion over nature through this scalar energy realm. And that's what I'm getting at. Scalar energy is, an, is a new branch of physics. And once we harness this, and once we understand this, we have dominion over nature. So my instruments are, are the beginning entree, if you will, to, to controlling that supernatural realm, the realm of scalar energy. It's incredibly powerful instruments. I guess I'm, uh, I'm right there with you. I just want to, in my mind, I like to place it as um, supernatural is like something that, that maybe we will never be able to understand. And I, I like to think like all these things have to operate from basic principles of how the universe works. And so it's just uh, at some point, we may we may be able to understand the mechanisms. We do. You and I do. We realize that well, many, of these, many, <laughs> of these char- many of these characteristics that we look at today are scalar energy consequences. You know, going back to an earlier statement, many of the quasars, pulsars, that's not electricity. That's not magnetism. That's a scalar energy event. And if we look even today at some of the pyramids, they they seem to be able to control a certain atmosphere. For instance, it's been known that sometimes rodent, if, if a rodent is found inside a pyramid, that rodent will not decay, will not experience chemical decay. Meaning what? That that's a scalar energy environment, that entropy is slowed down at least, and that even if a rodent um, were to, to lose its way inside a pyramid, it would not break down. It would not experience the chemical decomposition inside a pyramid as opposed to outside the pyramid. Why? Because a, a pyramid captures and harnesses scalar energy. It's a different environment inside a pyramid. Yeah. Um, I've been wanting to uh, build just like a frame, a pyramid frame for meditation. Um, just to like sit at it and see if that enhances anything. Have you considered doing I, anything like that? I, I actually use a pyramid on top of one of my Tesla coils. I surmount a copper pyramid right over my Tesla coil, and that seems to set up the scalar wave, this double helix wave. So I can attest to the fact that a pyramid will enhance a scalar signal. I've done this most of my life. So I, I'm, I'm very big on form. I'm very big on how uh, function follows, in this case, the form, geometric forms that we use with scalar energy. And, and again, to speak to that point, I work with the copper pyramid, and that serves to allow me to, to set up this double helix, to, to create this incredible double helix. Um. What's the, uh, so we're talking about pyramids. What about the rest of the platonic solids? Do they have uh, a use in your work? They they do. I'm, I'm working with cubes now. I believe the cube uh, will, will serve as the perfect environment for a free energy device. And what I'm trying to do is, is create a standing wave, a scalar wave inside a cube. It's going to be actually a cube of crystal. And if I can do that, then that cube uh, should serve to propagate, self-propagate a scalar wave so that that configuration becomes an infinite supply of energy, a source of energy that will never degrade. So uh, the perfect cube, in my estimation, is the platonic solid that will allow us to create a never-ending, immortal scalar energy wave to 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 create the wave or or condense it from to to, to, not to create the wave but to amplify the wave and then to use that application uh for energy creation in other words a, a scalar energy instrument working hand in hand with a perfect cube will allow us to amplify the scalar wave and create free energy. So that this, perfect cube will be the amplifier of the scalar wave. Okay, cool. 
Uh, free energy is something I'm really excited about, hoping it arrives um, quickly. And um, so I so I interviewed Foster Gamble on on the show, and he's like had this like multi decades long search talking to different inventors. He's talked to I think 650 different inventors, engineers. 20 of them have actually like validated working models, but he hasn't been able to get any to market or a lot of these people have been mm, poisoned or killed uh, in some mysterious fashion. Um, So yeah. uh, What do you, what's, what's the trajectory? Like what, what do you expect the trajectory on this part of your work to be? I would say, According to the timeline God has given me, within the next five to ten years, he'll, he'll give me the wisdom to create this energy instrument. Now, I want to make this very clear. I don't create the energy. The energy is from God. I simply amplify it. And if I can amplify, if I can magnify a scalar wave, then that's the beginning of free energy for mankind. So, in other words, if the scalar wave represents 1x, and I develop an instrument that I can ma- magnify that 100,000x, a million x, 2 million x, then it's game over. Then I have taken a, a standing wave, I've amplified it a million fold, or I can amplify it a billion fold, and in so doing it, then it just becomes a numbers game. Then you can, you can distribute free energy anywhere in the universe. Five to uh, ten years. How, so, okay, so how do you how are you measuring whether you're amplifying it, you yeah. know, a hundred thousand fold or whatever? I, you, you can't measure scalar energy because it's everywhere. There's not a finite uh, unit of measure. It, whatever you're going to measure, it has to be uh, able to have a finite unit of measure. Scalar energy is the element of presence of God, so you cannot measure God. So the only way I could judge this is by what type of um, a heat it gives off or what type of uh, illumination this device gives off. Mm. So I, I'm working right now on perfecting this cube, this what I call the perfect cube, the sacred cube. And once I work on that perfection of that sacred cube, then I have to start experimenting with that cube, which I think is the perfect multiplier, the perfect amplifier. And if we can work with that perfect cube, eventually we'll be able to develop a standing scalar wave that never experiences any weakening. There's no entropy. And if we can do that, then it's just a matter of increasing the waveform a millionfold, a billionfold. And if you can increase the waveform within that cube, you have created a miniature sun. Hmm. That's the um, key. See, I'm trying to imitate nature. I want to create a miniature sun. Okay. Uh, so, so you're talking about measuring heat and light, and before you talked about scalar <clears throat> waves degrading into electromagnetism. So, yes. are you you're measuring like the degradation of? No, that's of it? a good point. With this sacred cube, that's the whole point. I don't believe scalar energy will degrade into electricity and magnetism. If I can keep the scalar wave intact, then I have perfect energy. If I have perfect energy, I have the perfect means to to end the energy crisis. As soon as scalar energy degrades into electromagnetic energy, that's your die off. That's that entropy will result in the failure of the system. You'll never develop a perpetual instrument a perpetual energy instrument with electricity you can't do that i so, have to have this self-contained scalar energy environment that never never will anything degrade into electromagnetic energy okay so then an electric car motor wouldn't be useful in this you would right. have to have a different type of motor correct correct tesla did that by the way tesla developed a scalar energy instrument that he placed inside the hood of his car. He was able to maneuver, power a car by way of scalar energy, star energy. And uh, he made it very clear that he did not need the combustion engine. So he took out the combustion engine and he ran, he operated this a car by way of star power. 
Uh, how does it turn the wheels? How does it turn to a mechanical yeah, injury like th that? That's a good point. I, I, I don't have the schematics. I wish I would have. But apparently um, Tesla was able to, to use this kinetic energy from the sun and the stars. And instead of a combustion engine, he was able to, to I guess, attach this somehow to the transmission of the, of the engine and power the car through scalar energy rather than through gas. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm excited for you to, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people are really interested, like how I I'm having a hard time grasping, like, okay, we have scalar energy, but like when we're talking about useful things to us, like heating our homes or getting from one place to another, that seems to be in the, sort of material Newtonian physical realm. Yes. Um, and so there's like a conversion process. There's like, okay, how do we use the scalar energy for this right. Newtonian uh, dimension? Right, right. And that what I envision is this, there has to be a new, um, a new paradigm, a, a new uh, industry built around scalar energy. For instance, if, if I walk into my laboratory with my cell phone, my cell phone will not recognize the scalar energy signal. My instrument is so strong it overrides the electromagnetic signal, the microwave signaling in my phone. So what am I getting at? In a new, this new paradigm, scalar energy, we're going to have to replace the electromagnetic grid. And we're going to have to instead use simply this scalar energy grid, plain and simple. Also, it sounds like a big undertaking. Um, it is. So, yeah, you said you had a team of engineers, but like, who is helping you? Obviously, you're um, you're not going to produce these devices or sell them for other people to run, but you must have a support team, a research staff. What's? I'm the only researcher. I I, I lament to say that I'm the only researcher. You know, over the years, I've had I have to build these instruments. So, what do I mean by a research staff or engineering staff. Well, I have to contract with different companies to build everything from a vacuum tube to, to certain types of capacitors to, to Tesla coils. But at the end of the day, there's only one researcher, me. And so, why do okay. I say that? Because it's so difficult to spend your life in pursuit of this arcane subject and not to have remuneration. I, there's no paycheck there. So how how do you fund it? Uh, I have other means. Um, thank God I have another source of income. I have other means. And you know, this is the drawback. The Hieronymus, when I met the Hieronymus family, they barely got by. You know, they, they would sell some instruments, but that that's peanuts. How do we get from from concept to world application that's that's the real quiddity here i would just say by a grassroots effort we need to get the information out there and then people have to be altruistic no there's there's no paycheck here people and we we're looking for good-hearted people who want to be able to cure mankind of pathogenic disease um so i know that people can pay you for uh like continued yes. support from your device how much of that uh goes how, how much does that support your work i i put all of that back into my work it's we, we run it like a non-profit there, there's no money in it is there's no are money. you are you willing to share your other source is it like inheritance or, or I, I i have, an inheritance. I have okay. an inheritance yeah. amazing uh it sounds like a gift um it is to facilitate this work. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a scientist um, in grad school and in, you know, like even currently like debate among peers, working yes. through experimental challenges, super helpful. Do you have yes. any peers that you no. uh, rely on? No, because nobody has a scalar energy instrument. Let me provide this analogy for you. A hundred years ago, Derek, you had the only computer in the world would, would you have any peers? No. Would anybody have your knowledge of computers? No. Would anybody be able to, to give you advice on how to operate a computer? 
No. Why? It, it's a brand new device. It's it's a new concept. Well, that's where we're at with scalar energy. I don't know of anybody who has a functioning scalar energy instrument. Hence, nobody has my experience. Hence, you I, I have no peers. You don't want to perpetuate more scalar instruments because it's dangerous. So you're kind of limiting your ability to have peers because you want to keep it to yourself? No, I don't want to keep it to myself. If somebody stepped forward and they said, Tom, I'm willing to, to make this a career and spend a great deal of my life uh, uh, at this and study this with me, I would share all of my notes with them. But, you know, by sharing all of my notes with them, then what? Where are we at? What, what are they going to do with it? Probably you got, just you what got I'm twice, trying. twice the twice the vehicle to to deliver this research. Okay, and whenever whenever somebody, if you want to do that, Derek, come come show up my come show up on my front door. I'll, well, I'm I'll just share thinking with, like I'll share, you know. I'm being facetious. I'll share with you or anybody my results. I'm not going to share with anybody the schematics, but the key is this: the world has to see the merit. And I think the best way right now moving forward is to show people to prove that we can destroy a microbe, a germ, a virus, a bacterium. If the world sees that merit, then they will start to embrace this concept. If, if the world doesn't see the merit of destroying the HIV virus, I can't do anything more, Derek. I can't. I guess, I guess where I'm coming from is... Uh... You know, there's always a chance that um, I don't know. You might you might die, or somebody might try to shut you down. And I'm looking right. for redundancy, like ensuring this information is available to be continued work, like even you know, uh, in yeah. in the next several decades. So, do you have a I plan agree. for that? I I agree, and and the plan is to keep promoting this until somebody takes this up. I'm going to give you an analogy. When I met the Hieronymus family, this is back in the 90s, uh, the, well, Sarah Hieronymus, the wife of the inventor, knew that I was very serious. So she handed over to me many of these instruments and the notes, and she shared with me much of his research. To this day, I'm the only one that I know that is following up the work with Galen Hieronymus. So out of 7.9 billion people on the planet, why is it that I'm the only one who's taken the time and effort to follow up on this? You have to ask yourself that question. And when I die, who's going to follow up on my work? It's a lifetime of work and commitment. Who out, who, who, who is there? Tell me, who's going to step forward? Uh, well, I, I'm right now. I'm, I'm just sitting with this uh, gratitude that I'm able to talk to you. If, you know, if you're the, the world's leading researcher in this, uh, it feels like a, a big privilege. Um, Thank you. I'm I'm thinking of you know how. I'm, I'm going to give young... you an analogy. There's okay. another man by the name of Thomas Moray. Moray is a a, a a Mormon. He lived in Utah. His, during his life. And he was able, as an electrical engineer, to develop scalar energy instruments. I've written about him. And Moray spent his life showing that he had a free energy device, and he was willing to give that free energy device to the U.S. government. Now, this is back in the 40s and 50s. But he was always stonewalled. And I think the powers that be realized that this was free energy that he had discovered. Well, to this day, Moray's uh, family does not continue on with his work. So there's, an, there's another dead end. There's another great preeminent scientist, scalar energy scientist, Moray. He developed free energy instruments. He demonstrated those free energy instruments hundreds of times, but nobody took it to the next level. Now, I'm not a fool. I'm not going to rely upon the government or big business to take this to the next level. They're going to just stifle this. This is why it's so important to keep this at the grassroots level. Hmm. Um, 
have you have you considered partnering with uh, a scientific organization like maybe not the university system, but something like IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where they have grad students coming in or young people that are looking for a career path to you know to learn from existing I, researchers. I'd be happy. I'd be happy to work with. If if you know of anybody you can put me in touch with, I'd be happy to work. Okay. Anybody. Uh, yeah. I'll, well, I'll I'll work with anybody. If anybody's sincere, I will work with them. Okay, amazing. Uh let's uh let's continue our conversation after and yeah. maybe we can uh come up with some because I I mean I personally I I don't know if I could handle working in such sort of isolation. I mean, I know you're probably very um you know the the work is is its own reward but there's also like a collaborative element that right. um is really important for for humans yeah uh, i you're right that's the proper word i work in isolation it's, it's not that that is my preference mm. uh, i work alone i'm i'm an open book i perform many podcasts and radio interviews i'm not hiding i'm not trying to hide but very few people want to step forward and say, well, I'll, I'll spend the next 20, 30 years of my life doing that. Yeah, It doesn't happen. It, it hasn't happened, Derek. It's not going to happen. Well, I mean, really, we would just need people in there deciding on a future career to see this work and then identify like, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my path. Just like how, how you discovered it. Yeah. You know, I, I'm of sound health. I believe I am. Um, I have another means of income and um, I have the passion. Now, if you can find that in a person, then then that's the, the winning formula. But if somebody has to pay their mortgage, you know, there's mm -hmm. no money in this. You, you might as well work for somebody else in industry where you can get a, a paycheck every month. What? Uh, would it be possible to, um, let's say you were healing 2 million people a month and they were paying yeah. some minimal subscription, uh, would that fund the, that the work? That, that would fund our work. You know, you, you mentioned, and I, I've never met him, but uh, Foster Grant. Uh, Foster Gamble. Uh, yeah. Gamble, excuse me, Foster Gamble. Um, I've heard good things about him, never never met him. Um, maybe I, he would I'm, be interested in my work. Tell him about your work, yeah. Yeah. Well, Maybe know. he would be interested. You know, I, I, again, I'm rather transparent about all of this. Um, the website speaks volumes. Visit the website. You're going to see hundreds upon hundreds of diagnostic tests. People who claim, I don't claim, they claim that they no longer have herpes or HIV or hepatitis. People who claim that they're no longer infected and they, their doctor said they're, you're, you're healed. No, those aren't my claims. Those are their claims. I cannot, you know, if, if from a rigorous standpoint, I cannot speak for the people, and I won't. And the people speak, and it's their testimony. I had a question about, I was reading through the most recent testimonials on your website, and there's one or two that stood out of people saying, this is too much for me, or I'm experiencing digestive issues, or um, can you please turn down the amount of light you're sending me? Like, a negative type of experience, it seemed like. Could you address that? Sure. Everybody's different. I, I can't, I have a standardized approach. I try to um, administer just a certain amount of energy, not an overabundance of energy, but if some people feel that it's too much for them, that it's the energy is too strong, it's then it's not for them. Mm. It's not for them would if if there was like a way to treat them individually would you have to sort of like try to dial in the amount that you're sending them or, or what would I, your approach be yeah the, we'd have to customize an approach for people maybe only treat them for an hour or half an hour a day perhaps maybe they're that sensitive i don't know most people can can sign up and they can stay on the sessions indefinitely for months or years we have many people who stay with us for years on this program. So I, you, you see that, um, again, we have this standardized approach. Why? Because I'm trying to treat as many people as possible with this 
one approach. I do not have time to customize my approach for millions of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you've talked already about um, the ability to get rid of pathogens um, and create helpful compounds, vitamins. Um, right. What's, is there, is there more scope than, you know, getting rid of some right. things, adding some useful compounds? Like what's the scope of your standard yeah. protocol? Yeah. The, this, um, there are three modalities that I practice for the standardized. We're able to uh, identify and eradicate microbes. Number two, we're able to create nutrients vitamins, antioxidants. And the third component, probably the most important, is the chakra balancing. So on a daily basis, the standardized for an hour or so a day, we're able to target and disassemble pathogens, germs. The other uh, balance of the day, 22 hours, we're able to assemble uh, nutrients. Why? Because people need good nutrition. They need nutritional support throughout the day. That's why I keep the instrument on, that they're if you will, able to create, assemble vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, amino acids throughout the course of a day. The chakra balancing take, takes place only one hour a day. That's all you need to do to, to balance the, the seven chakras and the brain waves. Now, why do we standardize this? Well, I'm trying to reach the greatest number of people with, with simplicity, with ease. And most of the people around the world, we're still treating them for free because people don't have money. So this approach, this standardized approach, I purport that this could work with a billion people a year. That's my proposal, to work with this standardized program and to treat a billion people a year. As a grassroots movement, that's what I'm going to have to do right now. I'm going to have to move forward and and to introduce this to as many people as possible and let the people decide if this is of merit. Yeah. Um, you said chakra balancing is the most important. What do you mean? Why? Yeah. I believe that the mind, the spirit is, is the most important um, remedy, the most important uh, uh, way to address wellness. The, the spirit the soul, the mind. Many people say that the shock of balancing has given them a new lease on life, a new um, consideration for things. Uh, I believe some people have gone as far to say that the shock of balancing has allowed them to distinguish between right and wrong. This has corrected their conscience, the shock of balance. So for many people, the shock of balance is the uh, most important therapy in my estimation, it probably is. Mm. Man, uh, I haven't yet done the 15-day trial on your site, but I am super excited to. Um, yeah. You know, I've done 60-plus different, um, you know, healing modalities, for like hands-on healing to... Um, different types of meditation to, you know, just like visiting sacred sites all over the world. So I'm an experimentalist. I'm here's trying all these things, but. Um, here's, here's something for you to cogitate upon. A scalar wave has inbuilt the divine proportion of the phi principle, phi, um, mm -hmm. which is mathematically 1.618. Now, what do I mean? Well, there's a double helix to scalar energy. There's a major groove and a minor groove. The major groove is 1.618, the length of the minor groove. So in every scalar wave, you have the divine proportion, the Fibonacci sequence, the phi ratio, 1.618. Okay, there's a major groove and a minor groove. Now, it's my contention that as this fundament of nature, scalar energy is a double helix and it broadcasts energy and instructions throughout the world. Then you're going to find the divine proportion. You're going to find that Fibonacci sequence, 1.618 throughout nature. And if you look closely, all of nature has that pattern. It's a fractal, 1.618, the divine proportion, the golden mean, the golden ratio. Some people say that's the Fibonacci sequence. Where does that all stem from? 
it stems from the double helix. It stems from scalar energy. So scalar energy is the divine proportion. It is the golden mean. It is that perfect ratio, 1.618. And if you look at anything from a plant to a weather system, to the anatomy of the human body, the divine proportion, 1.618, finds its way into all forms of life, into nature, into, into uh, crops and how crops propagate, flowers and how the petals of a flower manifest. Star nebula are governed by that principle, 1.618, the divine proportion. So once we carefully look at scalar energy and realize it embodies the divine proportion and that by scalar energy sending out those instructions throughout the universe, then we finally understand why the divine proportion, this golden mean, golden ratio, is universal. It's universal because scalar energy is universal. Let me show you my, uh, I have a... Uh... Ah, the, there you go. The tattoo. This is actually done on a whim uh, for Tattoo Taco Tuesdays. Uh, there's there's a restaurant in Bali where I used to live. You buy a taco, get a free tattoo. And I was like, I don't know what I should put. And I, it's, it's like, that's a perfect shape. But then it's like shows up everywhere. You know, the, the golden it ratio. Does. <laughs> and then you, have, then you have to ask yourself, okay, if that's the effect, the golden mean, the divine proportion, 1.618 is a value. What caused it? Where is that from? Why does the universe have that signature? It's from scalar energy. Cool. Um, I feel like you should also meet Robert Edward Grant, who I don't know personally, but uh, he studies, um, he's like such a polymath that studies, you know, geometry and energy and archaeology and consciousness and all these things. I feel like you guys would get along so if i meet if i meet him first i'll i'll introduce you um okay, thank you yeah I, I do need help getting disseminating this information um it, it i know this is an esoteric topic i'm willing to teach people i'm willing to i'm sharing my information to the four corners of the earth the key is that people have to now participate you see, with Moray, my predecessor, he, he demonstrated free energy in Utah. Nobody participated. Mm -hmm. Hieronymus, my predecessor, he worked with NASA, the United States government, etc. But I think the government finally clued into this. What he had discovered was free energy. And the, and the government was no longer interested in working with Hieronymus. It's just, it will, it will upset the military industrial complex. Let me make that very clear. Free energy changes the military industrial complex. So unless those parties that out there that are willing to, to see into this new paradigm, a new military industrial complex, you're going to get nothing but friction. I would, I would go so far as to say that uh, if some, if it um, teaches people morality, then probably the military industrial complex would just dissolve. Um, yeah. who really needs it. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're right. It's, 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 it's such a game changer. See, this is what Tesla saw. Tesla had free energy. But during his day, the, the Rockefellers were intimidated by him. Mm -hmm. The Rockefellers knew that if Tesla brought out this new energy, this free energy, that then you no longer need the electrical company. Railroads would, would, uh, suffer tremendously because you don't need to transport goods and services. You can create them with scale energy. And the pharmaceutical industry, the Rockefellers were, are still behind the pharmaceutical industry. And if Tesla had an easy way to improve human health, well, there, there goes that pharmaceutical industry and the profits to be derived from pharmaceutical sales. So I, I, I can't emphasize this enough that this energy it's it's much more than what I've just described. It's a new way of living. Scalar energy will will make obsolete 
many of the inventions today. Yeah, I feel that. Um, you uh, so so um, we started off talking about HIV, and um, I think something that's probably on people's minds is uh, COVID. Have you <laughs> successfully treated or been able to eliminate yes. this virus? Yes. Well? During the pandemic, I've worked with myself and family members, and none of us went to the hospital. Now, the fact that I'm working every day with a scalar energy instrument and I can destroy, I can disassemble COVID on a daily basis, that means that I have never had the full-blown symptoms of COVID. Do I think I was infected? Yes. Did I have an immune response? Somewhat, yeah. Did I have to go to the hospital? No. Was I ever short of breath? No. Why? Because I can destroy any virus on a daily basis. Um, one question I had was, uh, so you, you have these pictures, you have like a whole stock of photos that match the viruses, um, but there's a lot of different strains of COVID. Do you have to get a picture of each different strain in order for it to be effective? No, that's a good point because many of the um, uh, different clads share this uh, homology that, that is similar. For instance, let's say you have five different strains, if you will, five strains of the COVID, but you have a photograph of one of those strains and that, that genetic material is responsible and held in common, say with 95% of the other strains of COVID. So one photograph of the COVID-19 virus would have, would share the homology, would share the genetic structure of these other four or five clads strains of COVID. So one photograph would destroy 95% of the genetic material of COVID. Mm, okay. that's, all, that's all you need to do. If you start destroying disassembled 95, 96% of the genetic material of any virus, that virus can't function. Okay. Do you have a good photo of COVID? I have probably 300 different photographs of the COVID-19 virus. Okay. Yeah. In other words, with all with all of those photographs of, of COVID, I have Omicron, I have different variants. So I, I would I would hazard a guess I have at least 98% of all the genetic material of the COVID-19 virus. And because of that, on account of the fact that I have so many photographs of COVID-19, then I can destroy, disassemble approximately 98% of the genetic material of COVID-19. No virus can operate, function with only two percent of its of its genome intact. Um, and then, so myocarditis um, is that treatable? My understanding is that's like um, you know just the the scarring or the tissue damage resulting from the virus. What can you address we're, that? We're, we're going to see uh, many long-standing complications with COVID. So I cannot to answer your question. I cannot rebuild tissue. I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. I cannot regrow, rebuild hard tissue. No. No. So the best bet is just to uh, minimize the infection. Yes. End it as soon as you detect it. Yeah. Exa exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I am. Um, you know, there, there, it's it's so sad to see what, what this pandemic has done. And, and many people have, you know, it, it has compromised uh, their health. Autoimmune disease, myocarditis, it, it, the list goes on and on. Uh, the, the smart thing is to nip it in the bud. You know, I work, when I work and I treat people on a daily basis, COVID-19 is one of the microbes that I look for that we're able to disassemble on a daily basis. And if you can do that, then th these, these viruses, spirochetes, fungi, parasites do not have the ability to cause long-standing uh, break, if you will, long-standing infection and hence a, a, an acute uh, situation of, of infection. And therefrom, the the degradation, the damage to be caused by this microbial presence. You have to get rid of it. If we get rid of it on a daily basis, then it's not going to have that long-standing impact. Yeah. Um, so, so obviously health is super important to people. That's where you've decided to focus first to, to 
um, make people aware. Uh, are there other applications that are exciting that you haven't pursued um, for this? Yeah, I, I, I think that if scalar energy is the, is the means of learning, in other words, if, we're, if we are enlightened by scalar energy, by scalar light, I would like to use scalar energy to learn. And mm. instead of reading, we would simply have a download of scalar energy. Instead of having to study or having to practice, we would have a download of scalar energy. And it's possible. I'll, I'll give you examples. Um, you, you've, you've heard of the movie Rain Man. There was an actual Rain Man. His name was Lawrence Peak, Lawrence Kim Peak. And for some reason, he had a scale energy mind in which he could memorize books. And it's been said that, that he had such an incredible mind. And this is now all something that he did not have to train necessarily. He could read Raymond Lawrence Peake, could read two pages simultaneously. If he had a book in front of him, his left hand eye would read the left hand side of the page of the book, and his right eye would read the right-hand side page of the book. And he'd read the book simultaneously, two pages simultaneously, one with each eye, respectively, and he could retain what he read. Now, that's a scalar energy gift, and that's possible. If Lawrence Pete could do that, I can do that. You can do that, Gary. All we need is to, to unleashed, if you will, to unwrap that potential, that scalar energy potential. Everybody has that potential. So in the future, I would like to retrace the steps of this man, Raymond Lawrence Peake, and I'd like everybody to have his ability to read and to comprehend and mm. to memorize. Cool. Yeah, there's. Um, it's making me think of these... Um, you know, different kids that, that you might label as a savant. I don't know if that's politically correct, yes. but um, there's one in particular that can write. Um, he just sort of channels or downloads any font and can yes. write in, in a, in a font. He's like a four-year-old. Um, yes. And, and all of that is innate. In other words, how did they learn it? They did not. How did Rain Man learn this? He did not. It was downloaded. It was innate. It was a gift. It was natural. Hey, there's a man by the name of Daniel uh, Tammet. He he can memorize thousands of places of the uh, of the uh, ratio uh, pi. Pi is a repeating; it's a transcendent number, and he's been able to memorize thousands, if we will, of <laughs> places of that of that uh, construct of that mathematical value. How do you do that? And how did how is it that some people can pick up a language and, and memorize, learn a language in a short period of time? These are all scalar energy gifts. Everybody has this potential. We just haven't learned how to switch ourselves into that scalar energy realm. Now, do you think uh, a device would aid in that? Or do you think it's just yeah. a um, frame of viewing the world? We, we, we have to figure out a way to access the scalar energy mind. Everybody's a genius. Everybody has a scalar energy mind. We have to figure out a way to access that mind. And perhaps the, the instrument that I envision is the, the interface, is the way to unfold and to present that, that paradigm of thought. Everybody has a scalar energy mind, a brain that's filled, if you will, with scalar energy that has that capacity. Man, uh, exciting possibilities. It's going to be a, an amazing future. Um, well, what uh, what haven't I asked you about that, that you want to that you want to make sure to mention? Uh, let's see. What 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 can we also address? Um, I want to make this very clear. Scalar energy. I've worked with this my entire life. It's non physical. It's not a chemical. It's the essence of God. Uh, if I had to describe it, it's it's the all-seeing eye, or it's it's the energy, it's the energy of Jesus Christ. And what am I getting at? It's it has no downside. There is no allergic reaction to this. 
It's non-physical. There is no carbon footprint. It's free energy from the sun and the stars. As a matter of fact, all life depends upon scalar energy. So it's benign. I want people to welcome this. It's a benign type of energy that is only going to help mankind significantly. So let's embrace this concept. Visit my website. It's a benign website. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> uh, to that extent, I offer anybody in the world 15 days of free session. Anybody can visit the website. Remember, all you do is you're going to upload a photograph. Send us your photograph. I work with people by way of their photograph. You do not visit me. Everything I do is by way of a photograph, which is your bi-located version. That's another subject that we could speak for, for months on. <laughs> a photograph represents me. Obviously, it's not me, but all of my information is found in a real-time capacity on my photograph. Meaning what? That there is a realm of bilocation, that scalar energy bilocates, so that I do not have to be present inside my instrument. I can send my bilocated version, my photograph, and my photograph will achieve, will experience that scalar energy. I don't have to be there. So I bilocate. That's another concept. Many people in the past have been known to bilocate. I think I just uh, I think I just lost your audio there. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, okay, we're, that, we're still there. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, is it is a photograph? Uh, is it something to do with the photons? Because you're talking about scalar light. Um, yeah. Is it that you need the photons from the photograph for the information? You no, know, I think I think the the photograph itself just carries a scalar energy signature. Many times when we speak of photons. I think that we should really just keep that within electromagnetic consideration because a photon does have mass. It has some type of, um, some, some type of uh, mass to it. Whereas scalar energy is, is massless. It's, there is, it's non-physical. It's pure information. So what am I getting at? Well, there's two physics books. And when we're looking at a scalar energy physics book, everything is non-physical does not have mass, it's non-physical. So all, it's pure spirit. That's probably the best way I could describe any type of scalar energy event. It's spirit, it's non-physical, it's never physical. Um, would you say that consciousness and scalar energy are the same? Yep, identical, very good. Okay. So what do I have there? I have a consciousness instrument. I have an instrument that picks up on intelligence or consciousness. Cool. Um, yeah. yeah, perfect. It all makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. You know, once you once you get your head around this, you realize there has to be two physics. You you know, scalar is not electrical, electrical is not scalar. And once you realize that there's two principles of nature that that there are certain laws of scalar energy that are not the laws of electromagnetic energy. And the fact that scalar energy propagates everywhere in the universe, it's everywhere instantaneously, well, it cannot be mass. Only thought can propagate throughout the universe with, without slowing down, so to speak, without being encumbered by mass. So it's, it's massless, it's non-physical, it's the essence of God. Yeah, perfect. Um, I always try to put it in the, the description I use is that um, consciousness is, is fundamental and that the material world is essentially a byproduct. Um, and so you're talking about like a, a, a degradation, but it's like it, consciousness is the foundation and then the material world is the result. Yeah. If, if, um, if, if you've ever uh, seen photographs of a of a very strong tornado and the aftermath of a tornado. Many times people will see after a tornado that two objects have fused together. Mm -hmm. I've actually seen photographs of um, 
of, of a fence or a hose that was uh, fused together inside a tree. So what am I getting at? Now, a tornado is a double helix. It's, it's a scalar energy vortex, so to speak. There's and during, a, very, during very powerful tornadoes, you have a scalar energy force field that assumes that that will at least be a, a local scalar energy force field. And in that force field, during very powerful tornadoes, let's say this is a tree and this is a garden hose. Well, th that tree and that garden hose then under the influence of scalar energy become non-physical or they lose their molecular bonds so that the tree opens up its molecular bonds and the hose opens up its molecular bonds and they can fuse one into another. And after the tornado, the, the tree and the hose interlock and they fuse together. And after the tornado passes, you'll see that a tree and a garden hose are fused into one another. And many people have never quite understood that, the aftermath of a tornado where two objects fuse together well, it becomes very apparent that during very strong tornadoes, it's a scalar energy force field. And then the, the, the tree and the garden hose, just for a temporary point of time, become non-physical. They are now spirit-like in the scalar energy force field. And the force field is so strong, a scalar energy force field, causing the tree and the garden hose to lose its molecular rigidity and the two will accompany one another in a locked formation. And after the, if you will, tornado passes, the tree and the garden hose are fused together. That's uh, that that's so weird. It's uh, it's fascinating. There's a there's a bridge here, the Eads Bridge in St. Louis, where I live. That um, there's a there's a tornado, you know, in the early 1900s, yeah. uh, where like a tree went through a steel beam and then after the tornado it was just like stuck in the side of the bridge and I was like whoa um, yeah that would also explain yes. um if they're losing their gravity then it could in addition to the force of the wind it could also explain like why you see flying cows or houses yes. because they're much lighter theoretically correct. than they would be correct correct hmm. now why do i make that point well we're now starting to understand nature and there are scalar energy events in this world and tornadoes, very strong tornadoes are an example of a very strong scalar energy force field and the aftermath in which two physical objects interpenetrate one another and remain fused into one another is a sign that a scalar energy event took place. So this, this is that other realm of energy. That's not electricity and magnetism in operation, obviously. That's a scalar energy event. Uh, just, a, just a quick question uh, on definitions. Um, why, why do you call it an energy? Uh, that's a good point. It, it performs work. That's a good point. Light energy performs work. Scalar energy can perform work a work function okay but it's outside of the e equals mc square equation it's not newtonian exactly see this god bless einstein this is, this is drawback there's two energies tessa tried to make this very clear to einstein i don't think einstein quite grasped it at least he didn't publicly mm. declare that there was a scalar energy realm if you look closely at the work of tessa tessa called electricity electromode electromotive force. And then when he started working with scalar energy, he called that new energy radiant energy. So you have electricity, electromotive force, or radiant energy. There's two energies, according to Tesla. And, and Tesla was the better man because he understood that there was two dimensions. Whereas Einstein, I don't think, ever really quite grasped the fact that, that there was another dimension. That, that curtailed his advancement. I think people might also get caught up in the word dimension um, because when we think of dimensions, like we think of the three dimensions plus time, you know, and, and then dimensions going on up from there, but, but is it really another dimension or is it? Um, it it's another dimension. Huh? I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why. Okay. When, when Grabenikov was on his flying platform, 
many times Rebenikoff said that he was invisible, even though he could see people below him on his flying platform, he was invisible to the naked eye. And he, he mentioned that when he was aloft, his wristwatch never advanced. He was outside of time. So okay. by, by the admission of Grebenikov, time was no longer factoring in. He was outside of time. He was in a different dimension. Did he have any consciousness effects or thought effects when he was in his device? Did it like change his? It, it, I, I think it accelerated his, his mental processes. Hmm. Interesting. I think it really piqued his, his not only his curiosity, but his. I, I think he became hypersensitive while while in this anti gravity environment. If the world only knew. <laughs> well, this is this is great. This is super exciting. Um, where would you like to point people? What uh, should they do next? Visit my website, scalarlight.com. You decide. You read the testimonies. You can read. I have 300 articles that I've written. You decide if this is of merit. You decide if there's another dimension called scalar energy. And then if you're favorable, sign up for the 15-day free session. Anybody in the world will treat for free for 15 days. Scalarlight.com. All right. Uh, Tom, it's been a, been a real pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Derek.